All right, we'll get underway. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues, our continuing series of conversations with news and policy makers or people who are doing interesting, important work in, in this region and beyond. Today, we're delighted to be joined by the president of the business called New Walkie. And we're going to find out more about New Walkie today when we talk with its president, Angela Damiani. Please give her a warm welcome to Marquette University Law School. So Angela describes New Walkie, and we're going to spend a little time talking about what New Walkie is for those of you who are not as familiar with this business. Um, you call yourself a social architecture firm. What does that mean? Absolutely. And I apologize for the jargon that you'll probably hear. Okay. I have a business partner whose title is the create chief idea officer, and it means that he makes up words ad hoc <laughs> all the time. Um, but social architecture is a, a real theoretical term, and it's defined as um, the ability to consciously design a place by shifting the behaviors of a population towards one goal or set of goals. And in the case of Milwaukee, the place is the city of Milwaukee. Uh, the social behaviors are how people live, work, play, learn, and the goal is to make this the most awesome city on the planet. So mm -hmm. all of our programs push that goal forward. Um, and we are funded as a talent service provider for local corporations who are hoping that their employees will want to stay within the company, but in a larger goal in the state of Wisconsin because we need a pool of talent in order to actually have a workforce to work at the employers that are here. We'll talk about that uh, in just a couple of minutes. I, I wanted to give people a sense of how this came to be. And, and let's go back to, to 2009. Uh, one of your partners, Ian Abstin, uh, who uh, had this idea of wanting to get together uh, with people here in Milwaukee. So how did this go from that to what it is today? Uh, he hates this, but he's not in the room, so I'll say it this way. <laughs> Ian moved to Milwaukee as a fresh graduate, had a job at a local nonprofit with um, a bunch of his coworkers being double or more than his age, and he had no friends. And so... <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah, it's good he's not in the room. Yeah, tonight. exactly. <laughs> You know, it's hard after being in that college life where you have new classes every day and you have this like surge of people who are your peers all the way around you to transition into a new city where you're at a bar and maybe as a guy you want to ask another guy to play basketball with you sometime and there's just like no comfortable way to transition there. Um, and so he had a really like harebrained idea. It was super simple. The first program was called a social. And he thought if we meet every two weeks in a new place, I'll be able to explore the city and go to places that I want to try but I don't want to do by myself. And if we meet regularly, so more than once a month or once a quarter, maybe we'll be able to actually start these relationships and then transitioning from, hey, I've seen you before, you're my acquaintance, do you want to play basketball with me, will be a much easier transition. And so that was the original program. It was just a group of people, his 10 friends that got together every two weeks. They would go to parks, bars, restaurants. Um, maybe they'd go catch a show or a game. Uh, but there was something to this. I think at the time, this was at the beginning of social media really becoming mainstream. And um, there wasn't a lot of activity like this in Milwaukee at the time either. Now there's dozens of groups, and they're all really niche. And it's amazing to see because at this point in Milwaukee, if you're not connected as a young professional, it's because you choose your couch yeah. over participating in something. Um, but at this point, he was making a lot of noise and people were listening. And so he had been running this program by himself with a couple of his buddies for about six months, and I moved home to Milwaukee. Um, you have been overseas at the time, correct? Right. I had been living and working as a journalist in um, Athens, Greece, and my brother was sick. <coughs> And I decided that I wanted to come home and be near to my family. I had gone to school in Minnesota, and so it had been six years since I had been home. And I thought, well, I'll be here for maybe six months, and then I'll make a new plan, and I'll move on. Milwaukee is not where I want to live. Um, but my folks are here, and I can stay with my sister, and that'll be that. And somebody suggested to me, hey, you're new to the city. You should check out this Milwaukee thing. And I went, um, actually begrudgingly the first time, thinking like, I'm tired, do I really want to go to this pub where I won't know anyone? Um, and 
you know, when I think about that first night, there was something there. It, it was nothing, and particularly compared to the production of the programs we put on now. It was just a group of people excited to be there and excited to meet new people, and there was this openness and welcoming that I, I kept coming. And I started becoming really involved with Ian and the planning of things, and very quickly thereafter, the group started spawning, and so... The, Multiplier effect, it just kept it, growing and growing. Well, it was yeah. growing. I mean, even six months into it, there were maybe 150 people coming to the programs. And um, then, you know, you get enough people in the room, some people want to subdivide. Some want to go volunteer. <coughs> some want to go to an art show. Some want to play kickball. And so, because there was no, like, real structure to it at the time, it was just Ian and some of his friends... Um, and me along with him, uh, we said, yes, let's do it. How about we have a new Milwaukee football team and we have a Milwaukee art bus adventure on gallery night. And so suddenly we had a whole um, portfolio of programs that were all being run by these volunteers. And then in August of 2011, I don't remember how it happened, but we got permission from the state of Wisconsin to host a bonfire and a little social on Lakeshore State Park. So the Summerfest Island for people right. here, yeah. Right, exactly, right by Discovery World. There's right. a little, though actually it's the state's smallest urban mm -hmm. state park. Um, and it was really simple on our end. We had like a truck full of beer and uh, <laughs> our buddy was gonna play guitar on the, on the beach mm -hmm. and that was gonna be the end of it. We thought maybe 150 people would come. You know, we had been hosting these regular programs 3,000 people came. <laughs> and so at that point I said, I mean, and nothing happened. Like, we didn't have any liability insurance. When I think about it now, it's like a total nightmare. Yeah. Um, but I said to my partners then, um, we need to do this for real, or we need to stop doing this. <laughs> because this has gotten beyond what we ever imagined it would be. And now it, somebody could get hurt. I mean, nobody did, but to have 3,000, we didn't have bathrooms. There's no lights on that park. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it was super fun, but it could have been a disaster. And so um, at that point, we thought we had something because we knew we could draw an audience. And we had the email database had gone from Ian's 10 friends to several thousand. And so we were like, well, we have free unpaid events, and we have a free subscription. That's like the world's worst business model. <laughs> <laughs> what could we do with this? Um, but simultaneously, we were hearing this larger conversation happen in the city around employers saying they're really concerned about the attractiveness of Wisconsin, the attractiveness of Milwaukee, and this conversation around the next gen and that is shifting work needs. Um, workplaces are not allowed to be how they were. The compensation packages are not sufficient enough to retain talent. And yet, we knew what we were doing was not only retaining talent, it was attracting people to participate. And everything we did left whoever was involved incredibly excited. So whether that was an artist who had all of their artwork bought, a local business who suddenly had a new audience to sell their goods, a nonprofit who had volunteers, and potentially a new donor base, um, we knew that there was something happening with this, but we needed to figure a way to package it. And then we started to explore what actually goes in to the attraction and retention of these uh, employees, local corporations. And what we found is that there's a huge budget and investment in relocation services. So you want to come work at a multinational corporation, you get an offer, you're really seen as a viable candidate, they'll f move your whole family here and pay you for that. They will put you up in a house. You know, there's all sorts of, maybe they'll even get you yoga classes for your kids. I mean, there's lots of attraction um, budget. But there's not a lot after that. Once you're in, you're meant to just sort of find your own way. And sometimes there's employee resource groups that like are affinity groups to try to get peers who are similar to have a common voice or to have activities that they feel comfortable to do together. Um, but really, there's not a lot of investment in that latter part. There's just sort of this expectation, like, you're getting paid. You should want to stay here. And so basically, what we've bundled and the way that our business model works is 
It's actually a social enterprise. So all of our programs remain free. Our newsletter is still free for us to spam. How many you. people get your newsletter now? Oh, that's the fun part of this, is it went from Ian's 10 friends to now we have 201,000 people subscribing. So it's been an exponential um, growth in the last six years. I didn't mean to interrupt you. So your events no are free and... and uh... Right. So all of our programs are free and open to the public. And all of our services are free for nonprofits and artists mm -hmm. to use, um, to leverage that audience. Um, but a corporation can dip into that pool for a variety of things. So for instance, maybe they're looking for candidates. We have a large database to potentially say, we're hiring for this type of person. <coughs> Or maybe they have an employee resource group that wants to go volunteer, but you know everybody has their own duties day in and day out. They have their own things they're supposed to do to fulfill their job. Planning volunteer activities on top of that is nobody's job, and so that kind of thing falls by the wayside. Milwaukee already has volunteer opportunities, and so it's very easy for us to find marri marriages then between community-based experiences and what employees are looking for is that added benefit, that added push, the, the corporation looking at them as a human, full, fully fledged human who wants to be participating in the community at large beyond their day to day tasks. You sound like a dot connector to me. I mean, we in really respect, are. I mean that in a, in a really positive way that you connect people with their interests, their needs, all of that. Well, that actually is our mission to change the way people connect. Yeah, so. yeah. Let's, let's talk about um, New Walkie's, uh aspirations for this city. Because you said, you know, as, as a social architecture firm, you have a say in being the kind of city we want to be. So what kind of city does New Walkie want Milwaukee to be? I want this to be the last generation of being a net migration state. I mean, Milwaukee is a big part of that, but I'm tired of the headlines about the war for talent and the, and bright, fl the bright flight mm -hmm. and the fact that we have, um, including here at the Marquette, hundreds, thousands of students churned out every year and they don't want to pick Milwaukee. I'm, I don't want that to be the thing anymore. And the other thing I'm tired of is I, I did not grow up here. And so... Um, most of my friends and relatives that live away from Milwaukee perpetually ask, why are you in Milwaukee? If I could just never have that conversation again, yeah. I mean, that means that the picture of what happens in Milwaukee is still open, because I don't know that one social architecture firm can decide that for everyone. Um, but if those two things could shift, those perceptions could shift, and the reality of the fact that we're losing a tax base every year that we've educated, um, that's and we have a ton of college students in this town that right. many people don't think about or don't talk about, but there are literally tens of thousands of college students in this town on any given day. Right. Yeah. Um, so this organization, your business, has um, evolved over time, and it started more with a, a social thing. Uh, but I see you doing more and more in Milwaukee, doing more and more in terms of public policy. Um, and, and, and I wanted to ask you about that, because that's sort of a inherently risky proposition. Is it to some degree because you have certain people who may have these political views, other people have these political views, public policy can be very contentious. How did you make that decision? Well, for me, it's, it's actually the extension of the same thread. So if you think about 2009, that group of people that wanted to go explore the bars and the nightlife on one end, people who are interested in exploring the city have like, they've taken that first baby step. Maybe their awareness of what the city could be has been sparked, just a little bit. Then maybe the next level would be, I want to participate in putting these on, or I want to patronize. After I've been to that event, I'm going to come back, and I'm actually going to invest my own dollars locally. Then maybe I'm going to go and give my time and serve on a nonprofit board or on a committee, actually give of myself, shape shift what's in front of me in a way that I can actually have a tangible impact. For me, on the other end of that spectrum in terms of engagement is policy, right? So from awakening to what the city could be to actually being able to impact it, that is the most, um, it's the, 
the most tangible way you can change the way people connect. And it's the way we bring um, really good and engaged citizens to the table. And I, we have taken some stances on some things, but by and large, our role is to host a larger dialogue around what the options are and to empower people to participate. So for instance, um, when Northwestern Mutual wanted to buy O'Donnell Park, we hosted something called a Spotlight, which was a month-long in-person and online conversation around what O'Donnell Park could be. Because at that point, NM had said they were willing to commit several million dollars to the improvement of just the park itself. And they want it to be still a public place. And so what does the public want? Because right now it's not heavily traversed and it could use some improvement. And so Milwaukee gathered ideas online and we hosted several programs in person, actually on the park, to give people an experience to be able to say, well, this is what I would like. Um, in that way, we, are, we were um, a proponent of the sale um, in some degree because we were hosting the conversation on behalf of NM, but as you know, it didn't go through. And so our hope continues to be that the county is able to find a solution for that to improve the um, capital needs that are needed for the facility and to make it a public asset that is readily used. Uh, and so I, I am excited to answer your question about the policy stuff yeah. that we do because um, it's amazing to have people open our newsletter and to read it every week and to find out about what's happening in the city, but that's just one super tiny step. In order for us to make this a city where we have students that come in and want to stay, that this is you know, a mecca for talent, in order for people to stop asking me why I live here, right. yeah. we're going to need lots of people, every single person to be involved in some way. Your business, uh, Newaukee, has been um, supportive of the, the arena proposal. And, uh, and today, if, for people who haven't been online, uh, the Bucks uh, unveiled plans uh, for a $500 million arena and $500 million in ancillary uh, development around the arena. Uh, it would be just north of where the Bradley Center is. Why does Newaukee feel strongly about that? Why is that important to people your age and people who identify with Newaukee? Well, I think it's similar to our, our uh, position on the streetcar. It's development that will spawn other development downtown. And it's funny because we came out really um, excited about the streetcar, and then we were barraged with people on the right <laughs> sending hate mail. And then we came out as a proponent of the arena, and we were barraged with people on the left <laughs> saying that... Uh, we, Welcome to politics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... It was funny because those two announcements were like maybe three weeks apart and our inboxes were flooded with all sorts of things. I thought, well, you know, you just can't make anyone happy. Did that, did, did that, uh, was that daunting at all? I mean, for, for you and for others with Newaukee to, to get I that did, kind of um, feedback? I did make a public statement after the um, arena one just saying, you know, it's Newaukee's role to open a dialogue and sending my staff death threats is not going to change policy. If you care, contact your representative. And so um, I don't know if people read that. I hope they did. Because the point is, we got people fired up. But is it going to cause them to actually contact their state representatives? I don't know. I hope so. I hope that that like, fire in people's belly causes them to actually say what it is that they want. Because it's not, even if Milwaukee does want it, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's about what? people feeling empowered to actually vote. What is it about the arena and a streetcar for that matter uh, that, that is important uh, to, to Milwaukee? What is it about those things that you feel um, makes them something that you want to go to bat for? Well, I know the arena is not just for the team. And I have to admit it's been since 2009 that I've been to a Bucks game. But I don't want to lose the Bucks. When I think about Milwaukee as being you know, a fledgling second-tier city, in some ways it can be a third-tier city, the idea of not having a national sports team like that, I mean, it just it puts us at the same level as a place that I think it's only going to bring us back. And there are other cities that want a team, and that this is a watershed moment, and I understand there's a ton of other things that need funding, but... Um, 
This is a deal breaker with that. I mean, they will walk, and then we won't get it back. And the same thing was true with the streetcar. I mean, we were in Denver for our company retreat on, um, actually, it was really funny. We were in Denver in December when, um, I apologize, I don't know sports. Their sports <coughs> team has a downtown arena. Mm -hmm. And we arrived um, on Sunday, and we could not find a place to eat. And we, were, came, we came in at 6 o'clock flight, so we were all starving by 10 o'clock when we arrived. Every single restaurant was slammed downtown, and the streetcar was full. So they have a streetcar downtown. And I thought, oh, this is a picture of what it could be downtown. I don't know if any of you would come downtown on a Sunday, but it's a ghost town. I mean, literally, it's a, it's a desert island. And it, we couldn't eat. We were all starving, and we couldn't get into a place. We went to maybe six different restaurants. That, for me, is... And we could jump from six different restaurants on a streetcar while we were meandering around exploring the city. It felt like, you know, a world-class city. Mm -hmm. The city of the future. It's an expectation, isn't it? Right. That, that you, you just expect to have things mm -hmm. like that. Um, uh, you know, there was an interesting story in the paper this week about, uh, as we talk about the maturation of, of New Walkie and, and sort of the, um, the things you're doing today. Uh, interesting story, I don't know if you saw it, but it, it was about um, people who were volunteering in MPS schools, uh, connected again by New Walkie. Um, but that's, that's serious stuff. I mean, they had people who want to volunteer. Um, Tell us a little bit about how that part of the work you're doing today came to be. Um, the first volunteer event we did was actually for Earth Day, and it was a river cleanup. You know, Keep Greater Milwaukee Beautiful and the um, River Revitalization Fund hosts Earth Day celebrations, and all sorts of different organizations participate. They each get their quadrant of the city to clean. But um, I don't know if it was just the audience that was built you know, suddenly we had all these people who were excited, and then we were approached by nonprofits saying, can you help us build our own audience? Or if it was people in the group saying, I know this group that needs some help, can we get 12 of us to go on Saturday? Maybe it happened simultaneously, but in any case, people want to do more. They want to do more than just have a good time in their city. They want to do more than just read about what's happening in their city. They want to give back. And we find that a lot of nonprofits are so entrenched in their mission and what it is they have to do day to day. They have not yet kept up with modern communication tools. Uh, their databases are primarily their donors who are much older and who don't have, they give their treasure and not their time. And we end up being an entity that can um, marry an audience who's willing to potentially give their time and not their treasure, um, at least initially and uh, who want a seat at the table. So for instance, um, the Humane Society uh, here in Milwaukee actually decided to build a young leaders board that has its own governance in addition to their board. So there are young people in this community that are actually shaping that organization, participating in that governance structure um, beyond going to the, um, you know, clean up at the facility and things like that. And so I think there's an appetite to participate and there is um, a question about how do you start. And the nice part about Milwaukee is, you know, our brand voice is that of like a wet Labrador puppy. It's very playful. It's meant to be really excited. And so even if you don't know why you'd want to clean out the cages of the Humane Society um, on a Sunday morning, you know that you're going to have a good time because there'll be people there who are just as eager to participate as you. And so there's a double layer there, too, with it being fun and an opportunity for fellowship. i, I got to ask you, could, when you use that branding, you know, the wet Labrador puppy, I, I, I <laughs> chuckle about that. But as you move into policy stuff, how, how do political figures in this community react to Milwaukee? I mean, anytime you've got a, a, a list uh, of 201,000 names on it. Politicians <laughs> pay attention to that. Um, how do they react to the fact that you're now weighing in a little bit more on public policy issues? Um, I think they're open to hear the opinion of the organization, but they're even more eager to be able to 
actually host a public dialogue. Right before this, I actually was on a call with a group that's going to submit an RFP for the Gateway Project along the lakefront, and Milwaukee is going to be written into one of the RFPs for that as the mechanism for assessing public opinion, because the current protocol for that is a public hearing usually during the day when people have to work, and is usually targeted by a small faction of the population who can show up in bright green shirts and only vote, you know, vocalize a, a negative perception. And so we're eager to expand that conversation. And what we find is that, particularly with the younger subset, um, and 67% of that 201,000 is under the age of 35, um, they don't even know what they should know, you know? There are so many modes of communication and so many opportunities for entertainment and information to be imported to them. They're not aware that on some subsection of a Milwaukee.gov landing page, there's a hearing notice or that they should even participate. And so, and that way I think most of the government officials we work with have been um, excited that we've helped to raise awareness that these opportunities exist for public input to be given. And then in some cases, we actually collect that for them. And so that's been a really exciting opportunity for Milwaukee. One of the things you're known for is, uh, you know, sort of, as you said, fun, uh, different events. And, and yet sometimes I, I get the sense that there's a lot more to this than just having a good time. I, I, I use the, if you saw this, I mean, we're in the Marquette area. And so if you just go down Wisconsin Avenue a few blocks in the summer, you might have seen this all of a sudden, this little market area popped up in the empty parking lot that's across the street from the Hilton. Um, and so it was called the Night Market, and Milwaukee was behind that. And, you know, it looks like, hey, this is fun, you know, be like, but there's something larger going on there. I mean, that's been a vacant space for a long time. I assume you're just saying, hey, look, things are possible, that this doesn't have to be this way. I, I get the sense that Milwaukee's about that, that it doesn't have to be this way. Well, yeah, that's the empowerment piece, right? That people can actually participate in the city they live in. Um, and I would say we were less intentional at the beginning about where things were happening. It was mostly about our own curiosity. Mm -hmm. Where would be cool to do it? And where can we convince people that it would be cool? So like the island that's right. actually heavily traversed by bikers and, and such, but is not, they don't even have a building. So there's nothing to go to year-round. Um, and in the case of 4th and Wisconsin, we moved into the Grand Avenue Mall in um, 2011 and have subsequently been swept up into the saga of what it means to be a part of the Grand Avenue Mall. Um, what does it mean to be part I of the Grand Avenue Mall? I know. I know. Well, we're, I'm still eager to find out. I've heard very good things from our new leadership that there's... Um, going to be a commitment made to the community at large. I don't know what that's going to mean long term. Um, Do you have any feelings about what that should be? I mean, you're there. Your business is there. There are a number of actually smaller businesses, startups, that are mm -hmm. in that building now. What do you think it should be? You know, we were coaxed in by the Creativity Works Here project, which was offering low rent to creative startups, nonprofits, uh, who were interested in having an office space. And we were at that point fit within that. And then suddenly the building we were in went from 44% occupancy up to 90%. And so it, it felt for a moment like, wow, this could be really like a new development. Look at all of us. And I don't know the last time you've been in the Planking Day building, but it's an atrium and it's gorgeous with a huge skylight. So it felt like almost like we were all a bunch of kids in a clubhouse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that project hasn't continued and a lot of the companies because they were startups you know not all startups make it have left um, and so I do feel a little bit like we're one of the last men standing in the building um, I love the vision of it being something beyond retail particularly the Plankington building I don't know if I have a strong feeling about the new arcade um, it's just such a gorgeous building but I guess I'm open to, I think I'm ready to, like, Milwaukee doesn't have to live in the Grand Avenue. I think I'm ready to let go of that sentiment. And so if there was some, you know, amazing opportunity for the city of Milwaukee and a big development were to come through, 
I would be happy to move so that that could be furthered. Mm -hmm. so, so let me take you back to the to the parking lot north. I'm, I'm good at, you know, uh, meandering in interviews. Um, it's what I do. Um, but, um, but you said, you know, at the beginning, uh, events were less intentional in terms of where you're getting together. But that one, the night market, seemed very intentional. Right. So we live on West Wisconsin Avenue. I serve on the West Town Board. Um, one of our board members is Julia Taylor, and she's with the Greater Milwaukee Committee. And so um, one of their largest, you know, initiatives is creative placemaking, and particularly around West Wisconsin Avenue, its redevelopment. And so we actually were asked to participate in a strategic actioning session led by Steve Chernoff at the request of the mayor and his original West Wisconsin Avenue task force to look at what could be done in this corridor. And a variety of things came out of that. One was that there needs to be more housing. There's not enough body heat in that area, and there's a variety of new developments coming see that, yeah. online mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. even in the last two years. So that's been an amazing thing. Part of it has been transit. What do we do about the parked cars, the fact you get towed between three and six, <coughs> the buses, et cetera? That's still to be determined. Um, how do we attract new businesses and do things with the empty storefronts? And then um, how do we just create a sense of identity for this corridor that actually should be probably one of the more lively corridors because the major hotels are there, the convention center's there, Marquette's just down the street. Uh, it's connected to everything else. It is the largest artery in the state in terms of being a major thoroughfare. And yet this one little section between the river and the interchange is scary and dark and dull. And there is a perception of uh, lack of safety, which is not actually a true perception. Actually, this is one of the safest districts in the city in terms of a reported crime. And so it's just that it's vacant and, and the, the blocks are long and made of concrete. Feels desolate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we were curious about the 4th and Wisconsin lot coming out of that session because it's been vacant for almost 30 years. It's city owned. It's a surface parking lot currently. And its vacancy is actually quite interesting because it could be anything then. And because it's owned by no one in terms of, you know, it's not a part of Marquette's campus. It's definitely not a part of the Hilton. It feels very separate from the Grand Ave. It could be everyone's. There's still like, you know, a claim to be staked. And so we wanted to tackle a couple things. One was that most people who work in the major corporations in this city work on Wisconsin Avenue. So there's already that daytime body heat, but they go home. Why don't they stay? The second thing we wanted to tackle was that issue of the safety. And so that's where we decided the program needed to happen at night so that we could prove that people could come, they could stay, and nothing bad would happen to them. And then the third was that we wanted to make it open to as many different people as possible. We didn't want this to be young professional focus because the fact of the matter is if you look at the map of Milwaukee and where the pin drops denoting the city, it falls like right on 4th and Wisconsin. This should be the lot for the whole state, right, as a symbol. And so the night market came out of those three tenors, and it was exactly that. It was a market at night with farmers vending their wares, with artisans, um, and it was a collision of all the city has to offer in terms of entertainment. There was a live blacksmith. There were samba performances. There were food trucks and, of course, a beer garden. <laughs> and, I mean, I wish I had a visual aid to show you some of the pictures. Mm -hmm. Every single type of person came to this program. It felt like, like a block party. You know what I mean? A neighborhood block party where everyone is super like chummy with one another, but we're all downtown in the middle of Wisconsin Avenue um, dancing. And there was no like published publicity around like this is a dance party. That was not how it was billed. And yet it was like people came, recognized the joy and the potential of this, and then spontaneously erupted into dancing, everyone we did. I mean, everyone from little kids up to 90-year-olds couldn't help but feel joyous. And so um, we plan to bring that program back. We are still rooted um, in West Wisconsin Avenue's redevelopment. One of the things we heard from that program was the event is amazing. Thousands of people come to it. Um, but the next day, all the storefronts are still vacant and the lot is still empty. 
And so we're actually hosting a conference um, in June called the Empty Storefronts Conference that's going to tackle that. Um, there are all sorts of different things happening with storefronts across the country. Um, everything from using them as an Airbnb, Airbnb, so a hotel. The place we stayed at in Denver was actually a storefront that we could sleep overnight in. Um, or to having it be a pop-up place for artisans. And so um, the cool part about that program is it will start on West Wisconsin Avenue in an empty storefront. And then, because every neighborhood everywhere has empty storefronts across the country, but also here in Milwaukee, the participants will board a bus for the tracks of the conference and actually go to an empty storefront in six different neighborhoods and then come back. So it'll be an exhibition, once again, of the city and its different neighborhoods, those particular assets with the vacancies that are there. But yes, to answer your question, we're very intentional about our programming now. And everything, even if it looks like a dance party at uh, 9 o'clock on a Wednesday on Wisconsin, West Wisconsin Avenue, um, has a, a larger motive behind it. So I want to uh, uh, take some audience questions here in a couple of minutes, but, but let me bring this full circle. Um, you mentioned earlier that you did not grow up here. I think you said you came here when you were 13. You mm -hmm. lived in California prior to that, and you lived in the Twin Cities, and then you went off to Greece. Uh, and so you came back. So now... And I'm one of those people, too. I moved here when I was 12. Um, so, you know, you, you don't grow up here. So right. you have kind of a different take on things. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering at this point uh, if you can just be brutally frank about our strengths and weaknesses in this community. Now that you've seen it as someone who moved here, now that someone who has moved back here, what are we doing well? What's holding us back? So I have this theory that the people who landed in this state wanted to get to California, and then they got here, and they were like, oh, this is good enough. Like, <laughs> that, I think I, that comes through in our culture today. You know what I mean? There's sort of like, it's good enough. Don't mess with it. You know what I mean? And so I would say just generally there is a resistance. Mm, how do I answer this? I think it's, it's the answer for both. I find there is an excitement about the future and an openness to explore and try new things. And it's not a generational thing, because I've seen me people in all generations who have that sort of, you know, it's good, but it could be more. But there's a huge resistance. I mean, even when I was talking a little bit about our business model, you would be surprised how many introduction uh, meetings we'd go to where people say, we have a huge retention issue, and we ask, well, what is your budget for retaining your your retention budget, and they say, we don't have one. Why would we have one? That doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? It's just like a huge, like, no, this is the way we've always done it. Um, and so that is what sometimes can be. I do have moments where I'm not like a wet Labrador excited about the city. I definitely feel, you know, are we melting a glacier here? Um, because it's not like that in other places. You know, you go to San Francisco, and there's this sense of, like, I need to innovate faster the creativity and the excitement can't come soon enough. And here, you know, it can be one step forward and then like maybe six steps back. Um, and that's okay, like I have a lot of patience. I'm married, I bought a house, I own this business. I'm not going anywhere. Milwaukee's not going anywhere. So we know this is a long play and it's gonna take multiple generations to get to that goal of this being the most awesome city on the planet. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited, but I do, I do feel a lethargy at times, and just in the general culture. Just is it a, a simply a resistance to change? It's it's something that we don't know, and therefore we don't want to try, or are we just comfortable in our existence? Well, I think there's just fear in the unknown, right? And there's also um, a lot of sensitivities around belonging. Where do I belong in this town? I'm from the south side, I'm from the north side. Yeah. And so what I hope Milwaukee does is replace the unknown with curiosity. And additionally, just create a sense of abundance that like there's plenty for us to have and there's plenty for us to do. So at any point you can jump in and participate at whatever level on that spectrum I mentioned you feel comfortable doing. So 10 years from now, uh, what does Milwaukee look like in your, in your perfect world? In my perfect world? Oh, I 
hope that we have a streetcar. I hope we have that arena. I hope that um, we've made some serious gains with MPS. I hope that um, we've made some serious gains at quelling that bright flight. I hope that all of these, you know, like I said, long play bets that we've been making actually pay off. Are you confident? Yes, today I'm confident. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see how tomorrow goes. <laughs> <laughs> Could be one of those days, yeah. you never know. So We'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, as we do every time, it's uh, a reminder, just press down on the rim, not on the little ball, but on the rim, and keep your finger down on it, and we'll all be able to hear your questions. So feel free to uh, ask what you'd like of Angela, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Anybody have a question to start things off? Yes, sir. How, how do we subscribe to your newsletter? Um, you know what? Almost every button on our website prompts you to do that. So just go. So new, new walkie new walkie. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions? See, it's, you know, yes. I appreciate um, the slant of college students as, as a draw and people that are professionals that have a college degree. But what about a, another large part of the workforce that, that I feel is often neglected, the trades? And they're in high demand. Um, what about your membership? Do you know how many uh, young people are blue collar tradespeople? And do you do anything proactively to engage them? Yeah, I mean, I don't know the exact percentage off my head, but it's not geared towards just white collar professionals. It's meant to be open for anyone that wants to participate. And, um, you know, this summer, even with the night market, we had a huge, part of the installation of that was creating a pavilion where the vendors could go underneath. And we had a tremendous amount of help, actually, from the Mandel Group and all of their um, handy workers. And then the coolest thing happened, because they built the pavilion, they owned the night market. They walked around, like, strutting their stuff the whole time. <laughs> this was mine, you know. But you want uh, the, the, or, the, the firm to be welcoming to all That's people. the that's, point, that's, yeah. That's, yeah that's cool. Other question? Yes? Could you talk a little bit about YP Week and what you hope to accomplish with that? So this is super exciting. Um, Young Professionals Week. Young up. Professionals Next Week, week. Is it? it starts on Saturday. It's on Saturday. So we developed, and I will say, everything I have set up to this point has been pro-Milwaukee. And um, this is not a diversion from that. I hope it's seen as an ex extension of it. But for three years in a row, we hosted a program called Young Professional Week, which was a result of hearing the same thing over and over. We really need young people to buy our tickets to our ballet. We really need young people to volunteer at our nonprofit. We really need young people to know about the, what the Water Council is doing to try to innovate Milwaukee's brand internationally. Um, and so we had this harebrained idea that if we were able to um, collect all of those experience at a high pace, so almost every hour of the day for seven days, it would create enough buzz and excitement around very boring topics like, should I start a 401k and how? Um, and potentially, if we did it at not at a convention center, but inside of cultural institutions or cultural assets that young people don't normally have access to, we could get them to actually show up and pay attention. And so um, YP Week was developed. Originally, it was just 21 events around the city in mid-April. Everything from um, gallery night tours to um, actually, we do something with the, uh, the GMC's Mike Initiative called a reverse job fair, where actually the employers come on stage and pitch to a crowd of unemployed young professionals why you should work for them. Um, and there was a really interesting result in that, in that all boats rise. Almost every single organization that we work with saw an increase in their subscription rate. We had all sorts of young people participating and engaging in different elements of the city in ways that they had never done before. And so last year, after um, the success of the program, the WEDC, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, who has a subdivision specifically working on talent attraction and retention at a statewide level, asked us if we could explore using this platform of YP Week as a mechanism to brand what it means to be a young professional in, this, uh, in the state of Wisconsin. So not just Milwaukee. Not just Milwaukee. And could, could we find a way to use YP Week to applaud the amazing attributes that Wausau has as well as 
a place like Milwaukee because they are similar in some way. We're all in the same state. They're all mostly manufacturing towns with some agriculture. Um, but uh, they're all very different. And so we took on the challenge. And our goal was to expand to three cities this year. We actually found that the young professional leadership in each community was above and beyond enthusiastic. And so we're going to be in eight cities starting on Saturday. And there'll be 90 events happening all over the place. Um, the first is actually uh, something in Wausau called the Bubbler Awards, which is where we recognize the 10 best places to work for a young professional. Um, the criteria of which is distilled from a uh, Nielsen report about what millennials want and how that applies to their workplace. But the cool part is that um, uh, young employees nominated their employers, and then there was a panel of um, young professional leaders from across the state who distilled down the winners. So, it's five, for and by young professionals entirely. It's not your typical award show. So you've got a lot on your plate coming up uh, starting Saturday. Yes. Yes, it's going to be. It's a mere 90 events. It's not. No, it's fine. You shouldn't spend too much time worrying about it, I'm sure. Um, uh, other questions? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Can you hang on one second? I'm going to have Ryan with a microphone come over so we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, do you feel like engagement in your group really needs to be active? You need to go to events, you need to participate in X amount of activities, or do you feel like people could just use your um, entity as a way to gain knowledge? Like you said, reading the newsletter, where do you find people to be most effective and you don't kind of the split of in which, how many people really participate and how many people just kind of use you as a, a knowledge base? I think you can do whatever you feel comfortable with. I mean, I, I'm an excellent communicator, but I'm an extreme introvert. And so if I didn't have to go to 90 events next week, I definitely wouldn't. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think it's totally OK if you just want to be abreast of what's happening, you know what I mean, to share it amongst your own personal peers in the whatever way you do. You don't, not everyone needs to be out testifying for the next Common Council hearing, but you're welcome to. And that's all that Milwaukee says. It's going to be happening. Here's the time and date. And you're welcome to join and participate in making Milwaukee the best place it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Are you starting to see people starting to move through their life cycle? This was 20-somethings kind of when it started. And how are you going to kind of deal with that? Um, again, Milwaukee's never had professional organizations like yours. And they had to start with the young professional. I it's still kind of young in this, but how do you see that playing out? I think eventually I'll probably lose my job, <laughs> um, at least as the face of it, because I agree. We talk a lot about succession planning and about making sure that we're continuing to communicate. Like I said, when we started, there was nobody using Facebook the way we were, and we were able to gain a large audience through that. Now the third most used social media platform is actually Snapchat amongst 24 or 18 to 24 year olds. I don't know how to use Snapchat, but we've spent a lot of time talking in our office about how do we build a Snapchat strategy for um, the next you know, cohort of millennials that are coming up because the fact of the matter is even if they're not interested in volunteering or they're not interested in going to an art exhibition, we need to be where they are communicating the way they are so that when they do feel like it's time for them to get engaged, it's time for them to stop going to frat parties and actually be a fully-fledged human being. Um, we have an end to them. You made me feel better saying you didn't know how to use Snapchat. That's, it's OK. It's good, yeah. It's all right. Did I see a, was there another hand over there? Yes. Hi, I had a question. Um, you talked a lot about the national perception of why Milwaukee. And I wonder what you think uh, Milwaukee could do to kind of change that perception from its suburban neighbors, because sometimes I feel that the areas surrounding Milwaukee have that same perception. Why would I go downtown when I can stay out here where everything I need is? Yeah, I think there's a large us versus them issue here. Um, and I think our main recipe for that is always the same, whether we're talking about a new policy or we're talking about a new festival we want to put on. And that is that we want to make it as fun as possible and to make the invitation as equitable and as accessible as humanly possible. Because you're right, why would someone drive in from Waukesha if they could do whatever it is they want to do in Waukesha? 
You have to make them feel welcome and you have to make, ensure that they're gonna have a good time. And when they get there, hopefully it'll be really artfully planned and there'll be all sorts of intentionality around why they're there. Um, but that's, that's where we excel, is trying to start with those two uh, modalities and to let that infuse into every single thing we do so that as many people, no matter where they're from, feel like they want to. I mean, I, I have to be honest, when we decided the, the Bubbler Awards were going to be up in Wausau, I had a little thought like, oh, is anyone going to want to drive all the way up to Wausau? And we have 200 people coming next, on Saturday. So the point is the invitation has to be right and the motivation has to be right. But then people do what they want. I mean, that's the interesting thing. You just have to give people permission to behave. And then suddenly they do. Does I, I just want to follow up on her question. Does it, um, does it bother you at all? that people have strongly held views about the city of Milwaukee, whether they live in the suburbs or whether they live in another part of that country. You touched on that at the beginning. You said you're a little tired of saying, why do you still live in Milwaukee? Right. But, uh, so it must bother you a little bit. It does, but what I see at the base of that is just a, it's just basically fear. I mean, it, that's, that's all that it is. I don't know what it is, and so my natural reaction is to resist it in some way. And I think, you know, if you get people in the room together, or if you give people an experience that's like their own personal experience, um, it's going to be hard for them to deny that experience. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is tiresome, but that it is with everything else, too. I mean, it is just a, a larger goal. Sure. Yes, sir. Do you have um, any ideas about how you would use the gray hair in this room to help your organization? Because <laughs> it seems like <clears throat> we're here and we, you haven't really spoke, spoken to our demographic as being helpful or have resources or, you know, I happen to live right on the corner of Plankington, Wisconsin, so I care a lot about what we're doing. But it seems like we have, um, we would have resources and experience and the same feelings. 30 years ago, I moved here from San Francisco. So have you thought about how you might entertain having our age group be a part of your organization? Well, I'll say two things. First is that, yes, please help us in any way you can think. We are still a bunch of kids in the basement of the Grand Ave. Um, number two, um, Milwaukee is not a bunch of kids. I mean, there's no way we would have been included into what's happening on 4th and Wisconsin had it not been for Julia Taylor and the mayor and Steve Turnoff, and none of them are young professionals. Um, and so we work collaboratively with all different entities and all different generations, and it's not meant to just make young people want to stay. That is a core of our business because corporations are willing to pay for that. Um, and we do know how to have a good time, and so young people are attracted to it, but that's not our core objective. And Some of us used to remember how to have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you still know how to have a good time. Yeah. So you're coming to all the night markets then? You can, you can help schlep some bins or something. That'd be great. Yes. You talked about um, trying to retain the bright college graduates who are here in Milwaukee. Has your organization done anything to try to reach out? For instance, I think of a lot of students who are from Milwaukee who have gone, say, to the University of Minnesota to try to reach outside of the state to bring that bright talent back here. We don't have any specific mechanisms outside the state like that, although we do work really closely with UW and with Marquette. Actually, one of the programs hosted next week is here on campus, and that's intentional as well because most college students don't want to travel beyond the campus to actually participate. And so we do have interactions with universities to try to get them when they're young, but nothing specifically um, for people who are from here who've traveled to other places. Final question? Yes. <clears throat> uh, in regards to college students, uh, especially college students who are graduating, and I know because I'm graduating this May, uh, one month and nine days, now that I'm counting. <laughs> but uh, I would, is there anything for your organization that helps 
uh, college students who graduate, who want to stay in Milwaukee, who want to be part of the community here. It's just they're just having a hard time finding a job and they and uh, finding a place to uh, or relatively close to that job and all the resources that come along with that. Well, I'll tell you two secrets. One is that if you participate in the programs, you're probably going to find a job because there's lots of people that are looking for viable, wonderful candidates. And the other thing that we never advertise but I wish we could account for is that you'll probably find a mate. There's something about, <laughs> something about having a bunch of young people in a room together. We have many Milwaukee marriages that have spawned over the last six years. So um, it's not on the calling card, but those are other ways people connect yeah, in our yeah. nation. <laughs> but you're saying the networking, that if you go to some of those things, the networking is, Absolutely. is in terms of jobs. The other thing, too, which is much more tactical, is we do have a jobs board listed on our website um, for open positions, and we do uh, publish those every week. And so open opportunities are available. Final question, anybody? Sure. Um, having lived here in Milwaukee for, for 50 years, um, there is more to see, do, and eat than most people have the time and money to do in Milwaukee, so that you're already, Milwaukee is already closer than you think to being the awesome place that you want it to be. And I think that if you just get rid of the Sunday night ghost town, you'll be a happy camper. I agree, thank you for that. <laughs> So here's my final question uh, as we wrap things up. Um, I gotta ask you about what you're doing today. I mean, are you a planner in terms of a career path or do you just kind of respond to the moment, to opportunities? How, how do you do that? Some people are very, you know, they have a very sort of rigid path they follow. I sense you may not be one of those people. Well, we didn't make a business plan, if that's what you're asking. We didn't? No, we okay. did not. All right. Um, some things are streamlined. and You know what I mean? I know every single program that's going to happen between um, now and 2016. There are some things that need to be flushed out, and there are some things like announcements about a streetcar that will intercept or potentially need to get like folded into an existing program. So I, I have a fairly good grasp on the next 18 months and how Milwaukee is going to interact. But to be honest with you, it's been the wildest ride the last six years. I just, I would never have guessed that this was where we would end up and that we would still be doing this thing that was a hobby we did on our cell phones underneath our cubicles <laughs> um, during work six years ago. And so I feel really blessed for that. And I'm anxious to continue to ride that wave. Do I know what I'm personally going to do in the next five or 10 years? I don't. I know that the things that intrigue me about what our work um, are different than they used to be. Um, and so I'm curious about whether or not that'll shape shift our programming. If my own personal inclinations then distill down what it is we're doing or at some point, do we have to honor what Milwaukee has become as an institution and, you know, as the principles we spin off and do our own thing? I don't know. I guess the answer is I'm, I'm not really a planner that way. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to see where it takes me. Yeah. Well, it's worked pretty well so far. So. For sure. Angela Damiani is president of Milwaukee. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you.